your identity is not in what you do. So therefore fail often, fail freely, learn and experiment and take your successes and each of those failures because there is one. What's going on? You're listening to episode 45 of the Perspective Podcast, and I'm your host, Scotty Russell of Perspective Collective. This show is all about encouraging you to carve out time to build something for yourself. I know we all live busy lives, but try to find the pockets of time to pursue work that's important to you. I want to plug a super quick announcement. I will be speaking this Saturday, the 19th at Weapons of Mass Creation, aka WMC Fest. And I will be closing the stage at 5.25 p.m., which is fucking crazy. You can bet that I'm going to bring my A game and I'm going to go all out and pour everything I have into it. And that same day, crazy enough, is the one year anniversary for this podcast. I held off starting this podcast for easily over four months last year for reasons like I wanted it to be perfect. And if it wasn't going to be perfect, I didn't want to start it. You know, I was terrified of being judged and I was super scared of looking stupid because I don't know audio. I don't know any of this shit. So like, of course I'm going to look dumb. And while it's still not perfect, I know that starting this was one of the scariest yet the most fulfilling things I've ever sought out to do. And I owe a massive thanks to people like you for giving the show a chance, listening to it and then sharing it with others because... This show has massively grown in the last six months due to people like you not only listening but sharing it through social media. Like That is the number one way for this show to grow, and it's all because of people like you. That's not something I can control. And we just hit the 30,000 trackable downloads mark too, which, Jesus, dude, that I can't even fathom. You have no idea how much that means to me because I didn't even expect to hear 1,000 downloads in my first year. So I can't thank you enough. It means the world to me. This week on the show, we have one of my good friends, Alicia Colon. Her and I met two years ago at Creative South. And since then, I've seen her crush workshops. And just this past year, I saw her light up the stage at Creative South. So when I saw her talk and saw the passion, the vulnerability, not to mention the wisdom she delivered, I knew immediately I had to have her on the show. Like her talk this last year was the talk that blew me away the most. Alicia brings expert level photography and paper crafting to the table, but after talking to her, those aren't her strongest traits. I think she's untouchable when it comes to prioritizing what's most important to her in life, like family, friends, and guiding other creatives like you. She is the real deal, and I think you're going to find a ton of value as she explains how to reclaim your identity and refocus what you do in life. You can find the show notes for this episode, along with a ton of dope-ass work of Alicia's photography and paper cutting, along with some of her most popular blog posts over at perspective-collective.com slash 45. Let's get into the show. like for other people to allow them to kind of go. So if I can just throw up that like hazard flag and be like, Hey, yeah. watch out, you know, like, yeah, it, it's, it's, worth it, it's you know? the human side. And especially like the creatives these days, seeing all these juggernauts, it's like so many people feel defeated before they oh even start. Goodness. Like I oh even feel goodness. defeated half the time, like looking up to people That's, like yeah. Tad Carpenter, Bob Ewing, Eric Marinovich. And I'm like, Oh my God, I want to be like them, but it's my own path. And people need to know that everyone's path is different. And that's it's different. what this show is. Yeah. Yeah. And end of the day, like you be you Mm -hmm. anyway. Oh, dude, this is going to, this is going to be, this is going to be a killer episode. We've already started it. I've already recorded some of this, so so I might, I might find somehow to plug it in. We're already eight (laughs) minutes recording. You ready to get going? Yeah. All right. All right. What's going on, everyone? On the show with me right now is the talented photographer slash paper crafter extraordinaire, Alicia Colon, like the fragrance. (laughs) Yes. What, what's up, Alicia? Thank you so much for being with us. How you doing right now? I am so stoked to be here, dude. Thank you so much for inviting me on. No problem. After your Creative South speech, which we'll get into, and I'll talk about it in the intro as well, that you, it's not recorded, 
It's just amazing to have you on the show. So if you could start off by just giving us a quick Wikipedia page brief about yourself. Let people know who you are, what you do, and you know what you stand for. I grew up in Savannah, Georgia, which is the oldest city in Savannah, and I still live here. So even though I've been to Miami and I lived there for a couple of years in Atlanta, um, which all have kind of shaped my trajectory, uh, I, I still found myself here in Savannah, and I super love it. Now, I have three kids. Uh, nine, seven, and five, and uh, been married to my husband about thir- I'm not about thirteen years. Um, <laughs> and uh, funny tidbit about that: he actually remembers the anniversary date. I don't, uh, so he trolls me and he changes it like every single year. And so I work at Focus Lab, and I'm their commercial photographer, which I super love it. Uh, oh, and before that though, I was. I graduated from Georgia State, which is in Atlanta, and I double majored. So I have a uh, degree in religious studies, studies, also known as religious studies. <laughs> so I double majored in religious studies, um, focusing on Eastern religion specifically, and then uh, graphic design. Awesome. Yeah. I believe you started off in the design world like at a really, really early age. You know, how did you stumble into art and design and how did that lead you into where you're at today at Focus Lab? Okay, so my father actually had a vinyl sign shop. So he, my my father worked uh, as a, like a mechanic on planes. That was like his full-time gig. He had a side hustle though and he had a vinyl sign shop. So whenever you're thinking like this is like back in like late 80s, early 90s. So he would draw something on... Um, I don't know, for Corel Draw, I think is wow. what it was, ancient, right? ancient, so, ancient. Yeah, dude. So Corel Draw, and then he would feed it to this vinyl plotter that would like cut out the letters. And then we would put it on windows and magnets, like big old magnets to put on cars or directly on cars. Um, I mean, you just name it, it was huge. And so he designed logos and he designed like type hierarchy and all that stuff. And uh, Corel Draw, dude, I don't recall any busy air curves. I mean, we like straight up, like we're going in pixel by pixel, like cleaning the edges. And so that's what he had me do. Like, that's what I was doing as a middle schooler. And a middle schooler, you were getting into this stuff. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Unreal. It it was crazy. So, um, so once I started going into college and I tried like 50,000 things, like I thought that I was going to be a philosophy major. I thought I was going to, uh, be like physical therapist. And so then I like went and actually volunteered to kind of see if that was my thing. And it clearly was not, uh, love people, but don't want to help them that much, I guess. I don't know. Um, it was like, nah. so, um, I ended up convincing my parents to send me off to, uh, Georgia state, which was in Atlanta. It's like downtown Atlanta. It's, it's, it's gritty and I love it. It was a lot of energy and I, I just I mean, growing up, uh, outside of Savannah, I mean, things are, uh, so close minded and, um, uh, yeah, I, it was just really tough. So going, so going up there where it's like my best friend was very different from me in mm-hmm. every single shape, size, everything. Uh, I loved it. I absolutely loved it. So anyway, that's not about this, this, that's not about the question. Um, however, yeah. So I ended up double majoring in religious studies because I had a honors, um, what do you call it? An honor, honor scholarship mm-hmm. in order to get the honor scholarship. I had to actually go and take honors classes, but our graphic design program didn't have that. Uh, so that's why I ended up double majoring because it, it ended up saving me money somehow. Um, so I was like, okay. Uh, so anyway, so went there, did the graphic design. But the thing is, is that while I was in graphic design, I realized that I didn't like it. Like, even though I was like, we did the portfolio review and about like a hundred people, like, you know, vibe for like 10 spots. Uh, I got accepted the first round and I realized like straight on, like I did not like this, but after like moving to Atlanta, after changing my major about three to four times and, try- and finally convincing my parents to let me like, cause they literally thought that I was going to like flunk out. Cause I was kind of a party child. Um, Same here. So they were like, <laughs> Cheers. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, so they thought I was going to flunk out. So after I convinced them that I was like, no, I'm not going to flunk out. I'm actually going to do pretty good. Um, I hated it. I absolutely hated it, but I was like, I'm going to stick to it. And there were still things about it that I loved. Like I, I, I loved seeing what 
Like I loved learning, you know, type hierarchy. I loved learning, you know, just my husband calls it advanced colors and shapes. Like I just, I loved it. Like it's my favorite thing. Uh, but the white artboard for me was so overwhelming it, I mean, I would get anxiety and stress when I saw that, when I saw a new project and it's like, okay. And, and this anxiety, uh, even entered into my first job, which was for, um, I was doing like print campaigns for a nonprofit organization and I did that for three years. Uh, but I'm grateful for that. Cause even though I hated it, I'm grateful for that because what ended up happening was that I, um, found my love for photography, because sometimes it's just easier to create the image that you need. Right. Mm -hmm. And so I started going into photography and I super love it. Um, so you found, put, you found your specialty outside of college post-graduation. Yes, I did. That's I did. important I mean, for people to hear, you know, like there's still another yeah. path available for you somewhere out there. Just keep with it. A hundred percent, a hundred percent. And it's one of those things where it's like, um, actually, one of the guys that I worked with, his name is, uh, John Oates. He just wrote a, um, do you know, like Andy Durant's on the Shawshank Redemption? Familiar. Have you ever seen that movie? Yeah. It's yeah. been a long time. I know it, it's, it's been out for a hot minute. Um, so <laughs> it, it talk it talks about, or he wrote a blog post about like that job that you're in. Um, like you will learn things that will carry you forth. You know what I mean? And it was like this job that I was in, it's like, it, I mean, I loved the people and, and I, I loved what I was doing. I just hated what I was doing, I guess. And, uh, but it allowed me the trajectory to discover the thing that I did like, mm -hmm. you know? Um, so it also led me to meet the co-founder of Focus Lab because he was at that point, um, a web developer, which is Eric Regan. So he was a web developer and I was a designer on staff. And, um, he, he ended up starting focus lab while I was there. So in it's like infancy, uh, oh gosh, years and years ago before it was even called focus lab, it was called ideal design. Focus lab. And is so better. I was, <laughs> yeah, yeah, it is. They did a good job on that one. Um, and so I was there when they started it. Like I was kind of like on the sidelines, like kind of watching it. Like he came over, I remember with this business card and going like, Hey, how do you like, you know, our, our logo? And I'm like, Oh, it looks like a dude doing yoga. Like, I don't really understand. Like they ended up using the, like the eye with the dot and like bending it in weird ways. Yeah. I mean, it got you to focus lab, but it allowed you to stumble into your passion of photography. But where did you find this love for paper crafting? Oh yeah. Um, so paper crafting came from, there's two desires. One was not to shoot people because whenever you're shooting, um, models or people generally, they, they don't like themselves, you know, Oh, True. my arms are too fat or I don't like this angle of me or oh my teeth are janky. Totally you know? relate. I hate having my photo taken. Yeah. Yeah. Well, hopefully you don't sit there and tell people that like, look at my big pores. Like, it's just like, Oh, get over yourself and just do what I need you to do. You know, um, products don't do that though. And so I kind of transitioned to like shooting more of like the, the case studies for focus lab. So it's like, I would like, okay, let's showcase, um, a brand for the 15th time and let's put it on these business cards. So kind of focusing on more of a product and then combine that. So I said, there's two. So combine that with a start with super team deluxe. So Raji King and Justin Mazel started this, like, you know, love child. And, um, I was on the ground floor of that, like helping with photography at the very beginning. And they had these crazy like lapel pins. Right. Mm -hmm. And I was like, well, how can I make these like lapel pins kind of like come to life? And at that point I was like, why don't we use paper? Because anything bigger would not work, you know, and paper is really malleable and the colors and the textures and lighting and all that. And so I was able to focus my love for styling product, but then also paper and building sets. So this was that, recent, right? Yeah, dude. Like I didn't start paper crafting until like September of like last year. It just shows like you just keep sticking with it and like you'll uncover the next gold mine of your hidden talent somewhere. I remember the Pokemon one you did. Now one blew me away and I bought that pin. Oh, wow, dude. That's awesome. Yeah. I'm <laughs> a nerd you. like that. I like the Pokemon one. So, yeah, I, I, I loved all that, especially when the Pokemon thing came out. Were you playing with Pokemon, Pokemon Go? Go? I played that shit for like three weeks religiously. Then I realized 
I've been trying to start a podcast for four months and it kept like <laughs> pushing it out. I wasn't getting anything done. So finally I had to cut myself off because I have an addictive personality. I had to quit off video games over the last couple of years because I wanted to build Perspective Collective and that game sucked me in. Like I was wearing long socks and walking out in tall grass. I grew up on Pokemon, That's man. That, that was like hardcore nostalgia for me. And that was like some of the best times I had as a kid. Yeah, yeah, and it brought it back. You got into paper crafting just this last year, basically, through Super Team Deluxe. Yeah, pretty much. Uh, yeah, exactly. Wow. It blows me away because your stuff is so incredibly detailed and creative. It blows. I definitely will link some of this up in the show notes as well, for yeah, sure. Thank you. Like, it's one of those things where it's ever ever evolving craft. I mean, I still look at the giants like Tommy Perez, like he is oh in, god yeah uh, i've been yeah. following tommy for a couple years now yeah like he's incredibly talented and i remember um at one of like one of the first times where he ever like liked any of my posts on instagram i was like oh my gosh he knows who i am and now uh, he's at facebook yeah yeah dude is just so sick he's so talented yeah. and he's so and um, just a genuine human yes yeah, because I mean, I would, I, I'd be like, hey, what kind of glue do you use? You know, or, uh, and it was like, that's like the, the infamous, what pen is that, basically, yeah. in my world? <laughs> yeah. 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 And his what, answer, what glue is that? Yeah, yeah. It's crazy. And his answers were like, uh, I really like Elmer's. I'm like, what? Mind blown. I'm like, this is crazy. So, yeah. My kindergarten glue. <laughs> exactly. I'm like, I have three kids, I have tons of that. <laughs> Let's get started, stat. Well, that that's pretty cool to see that you're basically have stumbled upon your your passions and you know what you're getting paid to do and you love mm -hmm. totally after college. What are some of the other struggles and obstacles you faced along your creative path? Because the main reason I had you on this show is because it's not about the highlight reel. I heard your creative South talk was absolutely floored. Loved your vulnerability, your transparency. You kept that shit real. You had everybody captivated and it was the talk that I needed to hear to put my ass in check. And I still need to hear it. I revisit the notes I took every now and then. Um, but what are some of those struggles and obstacles you faced along the creative path? Because this, this isn't just all about, you know, success stories. Yeah, dude. Um, Whenever I started and making that transition, so like first, whenever I was at Focus Lab, um, I was like, well, hell no, nah, I don't want to be a designer anymore. Like, I don't want to be a designer. What can I do? Uh, I can project manage. So like whenever I was there, I was really, really good at project management. And so that's what I did. And then I got to the point where I was like, dude, this project management thing, even though I might be okay at it, like it is soul draining. So let me do like photography. And then through through being at focus lab, I was kind of introduced to this like world of like celebrity designers and like celebrity creatives, um, and kind of like working with one. So like Bill Kenny is like, you know, like, mm -hmm. you know, in, in industry, I think everybody knows and loves him and, and as they should, cause he's an amazing human being. Like it's, it's absolutely astounding, um, his heart. But anyway, um, I, I, was intoxicated with this idea of being a celebrity photographer, but within the design industry. I mean, I knew that there's, there's tons of photographers out there, but I was like, well, if I can position myself to be the photographer for designers, then that could kind of elevate my brand. And the, the problem was, is that I was trying to get my identity from that. You know what I mean? Like I was trying to get who I was, my identity from what I did. And the problem is, is that if, if you find your identity in what you do, your like level of stress or anxiety or depression will fluctuate with how well you think you're doing it or how well you think others think you're doing it. And I mean, I would sacrifice everything in anything, uh, including healthy boundaries with people in order to try to get my name in bigger circles. Like I did some of the stupidest stuff in order to attain that like celebrity status, quote unquote, which is, it's so silly because it's like, I'm, I'm not even remotely there. I'm not even close to being there, but I thought if I just kept doing this stuff, I would, I would get there. And then at a, at a very embarrassing, vulnerable part of me, I thought perhaps maybe then I would have made it. And then I didn't, I never did. You know, and it was one of those things where it's kind of, I don't know, like I, I can kind of feel myself like emotionally kind of getting into it. Um, 
what was it for you? Because, I mean, success for me, I, I struggle with the same thing. I, I, I totally get wrapped up in my my do that defines who I am. I, I still struggle with it, even though you gave me the reality check. I'm just more aware of it now. Yeah. But I have a hard time of defining what it is and constantly creating this vision in my head of like, shit, dude, I finally made it when I've reached this spot. But then when I get to that spot, it's something else. And I keep mm -hmm. feel like I'm on an endless pursuit to chase something because it's defined by what I do and not really who Scotty Russell is. It's about what perspective collective kicks out. Yeah. So yep. what was it? Yeah. For, for me, the it for me was I want to be, I want to be a household name within designer designer circles. I want mm -hmm. to work with the global companies that are out there. Like, so I would be able to name drop a company and people would be like, that's amazing. You know? So like you would be like a, a solo show and they would kind of hire you and send you out to places and stuff. Yeah, exactly. I mean, like my, it at that point was like, I want to build a brand away from focus lab that is completely focused on me. And it's my, it's my kingdom. Mm -hmm. I want to build my kingdom. And I realized like in order to do that, I was sacrificing my kids. Like I would have like my daughter like sleeping underneath my desk. She would want to spend time with me. And I pretty much would be like, I'm just going to make a bed underneath the desk that you can play in. Um, like I would have, I would, I had my husband once tell me, um, I don't look forward to coming home on the weekends anymore because you're pretty much working and I'm watching the kids. Like I, we, I get no time with you. Uh, that that's really hard to hear. Um, I, I got to the point where it was like, I would think like, Oh, if I hang around these certain people and if I act this certain way, I will become their friends. And because they work with these caliber of companies, um, that they would give me jobs and that my name would escalate. And, and therefore sacrificing myself and doing really stupid stuff, thinking that I was getting into the graces of the fold of the community that way. So what changed where you realized that your who, your identity is not defined by what you do? What, what changed? What snapped? What pulled you out Good of question. it? Good question. Because I'm not, that's still something, that's still something that I struggle with. And I know I get a lot of questions in my onboarding email of people trying to find time to balance their work with their day job as well as their family to build like something with their personal project. I don't have kids, so I want people on the show who do have kids. Yeah. So people can see the struggle is real, but these people are making a huge name for themselves, you know, bringing high pedigree caliber people on the show like yourself. Mm -hmm. And I think you have a ton of valuable oh, insights. Um, I, so for me, a huge insight was, <laughs> uh, was friends calling me out on it. Um, I remember talking to Justin and Justin Mazzell and I was saying something and he was like, uh, have you ever thought about going to counseling for that? And at that point it was like, like for me, I needed to have vulnerable people around me that I could just say like, man, I'm, I'm, I know that I shouldn't be resentful at my kids right now, but, and, and I know that like right now the, they are at the golden age to like hang out with, you know what I mean? And, and from what I hear, it's like my kid, my oldest is nine. Uh, but I hear it's like that, you know, zero to 10, like you are a super like superhero to their eyes. And, um, and I'm like in that prime age with all of my kids. And so instead of like using it to establish a relationship that can then carry us through the teenage years, I'm working yeah. my ass off to build something that doesn't even matter, ignoring them being resentful that they're there. And it's not obviously their fault. I'm the one who did that. You know what I mean? Um, and that was a huge wake up call there should be no reason for me to resent my kids. There should be no reason for me to want to sacrifice my, my family. And so what ended up happening was, um, on top of all of this, I felt like I was like hitting as creative, like stagnant wall. So once I stopped getting all of that affirmation and all those pings from like social media or from like features or, um, and it's, it's also one of those things. Have you ever heard of, um, holy frenoli? What is that? Ho holy holy <laughs> frenoli. That's like a, that's like a Diane Gibbs <laughs> Dude, yeah, comment. No. Yeah, <laughs> I don't, no, I like fudge nugget. Honestly, fudge nugget, fudge nugget. Fudge nugget. I say that one a lot. Um, 
I like that I don't one. know. It's one of those where it's like, it's uh, not obscene, but it definitely seems obscene. So it's great. Okay. What is, what is it? Uh, fudge. The law of diminishing returns. Have you ever heard of the no, law of like diminishing some returns? Some kind of product you try to take back to Walmart when you buy it. <laughs> You're like, F this. I don't want that. No. Um, <laughs> but it's not that. Okay. No, it's not that. Okay. So the law of diminishing returns pretty much says that over time, in order to continually get the output, uh, you have to double the amount of input. Does that make sense? Yeah. So over time, like, so whenever I was first starting like this whole photography thing, I would be absolutely ecstatic if I got like 10 likes on a photo, you know what I mean? I'd be like, Oh, I'm doing it. You know what I mean? But then as I continued down that timeline and that journey, I ended up having to work even harder to get that emotional rise that I got from that initial 10 likes, like maybe down the line, it had to be like 50 or whatever. It's like a, a drug addict, you know, you got to keep getting hired to get that same fix like that's what all this word that dude you're summing up yep. everything the likes the comments the features yep. like yep. yep it's a it's a total mind fuck yeah like it really is yeah. it really is yeah yeah so and, I'm and, and, yeah I'm glad i'm not alone no you're not you're not and, it, and it's definitely like i i really liked your um you just naturally put that in with addiction because it, it is the law of diminishing returns. I mean, like whatever Total addiction. You, yeah. You, you drank that one thing of alcohol and now like later on, like you have to drink like double amount of that in order to get the same like feeling. Um, and so I knew this going into it because I've, I've been to, um, I've been to recovery groups, um, because like I have again, addictive personality. So like I'm codependent. And so, uh, I mean, I've been through recovery for that and counseling through that. And so like, I, I knew this in my head, and so kind of like, and I, and I saw this slow that was happening with my social media and, and all that stuff. And then I realized, okay, like this is what's happening. And then at that point, that's when I needed to, like, I realized I need to turn this around, but it took me, uh, no joke. It took me about two years. It took me about two years to like finally turn the ship around. So how were you able to reclaim your who or how could someone who also struggles what we struggle with? Basically, I'm kind of I'm asking for a friend <clears throat> myself, um, uh, you know, like what are some practical steps for reclaiming your who when you kind of feel lost in your identity of what you do? Right. Like I know in, in your your speech, you kind of broke things down for people. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, it's actually really crazy about how commonsensical these things are. Um and how powerful these like exercises that I'm going to be talking about are. So even though they seem really simple, I would plead with you that you don't not do them. You know what I mean? So the first one is defining your priorities. And I think a lot of people inherently think that they know what their priorities are. Um, but until you like sit down and you really think like, what are they? You wouldn't know. Right. So I would say, define your priorities, think about it and just like list. Okay. You might know the top three. So mine is like faith, family, no faith, space, me. Yes. Faith, me, and then Desmond. So like self care. And then after that, it's like, all right, well, where's kids in relationship to work? Where is your hobbies? Where's your friends in relationship to everything? So it's like kind of looking at this like thing, this canon, if you will, that at this point you have your priorities. So then you can kind of measure like, is this, decision or is this opportunity going to mesh well with that? And then secondly, so one is define your priority. Secondly is doing the satisfaction exercise. And this was actually an exercise that was brought to my attention. Uh, whenever my buddy Raji, um, he, he ended one of his previous employments and he was kind of in the middle of gigs and he's like, what the hell am I going to do? And then one of his buddies was like, well, why don't you do this exercise? And then Raji was like, Hey, you really need to do this exercise with me. Um, I'm like, okay, I'll do it. So the exercise was spend three to five years no, three, not three to five years, spend 30 minutes to an hour looking <laughs> over. This is a long exercise y'all <laughs> yeah. long gain, long-term game right here. Um, so spend 30 minutes to an hour to review the last three to five years and pick the events and the things that you were not only most proud of, but you were most satisfied by. 
And I, I would actually even say more like you are more satisfied than you are proud of, you know what I mean? Um, and whenever I went into this exercise, I mean, because at this juncture, I have done photography for about nine years whenever I went into this and I thought it was, and I covered the array of like genres and subjects. And I thought that that's what was going to like kind of come to the top. I thought that it was going to be like, Hey, you really liked, you know, product lifestyle. And so you should therefore work, do more product lifestyle. And it actually wasn't, it was the conversations that I had with uh, fellow creatives that was in a muck and mire. And it's like, how, how can I help them get out of this? And I gave them some advice and, and they kind of moved forward or, uh, talking to other creatives going like, Hey, I'm currently doing X, but I want to do photography. How can I, how can I get there? And then at that point I realized, wow, what satisfies me is not necessarily the kick-ass image that I make, which I thought it was. And it was the very thing that I was chasing so hard after the the final product. Yeah. Like I, I thought that's the thing that satisfied me. But once I did this exercise, I realized I actually am way more satisfied helping other people get to where they're going, you know, and encouraging them to where, you know, where they feel like they need to be. Um, And so once you have your who, which is your priorities and then your satisfaction results, then I, can I ask how many, like, is there a range that you're shooting for, for how many satisfaction moments that you're trying to list? Is it a top five, a top 10? Did you say that? No, I didn't actually. So what I ended up doing was I ended up like just listing them all and then seeing if there were trends. Okay. Like overlap. Yep. Yep. Okay. Okay. Cool. Yeah. And then there, there's like extra bonus points. If you know, you're like super moto, which I can kind of see that you would, you would, this would be you, right. You would be like, all right, well, not only am I going to think about like the first, you know, those events that I'm really amped up on from three to five years, but you would go and ask a person that was walking during your course of life, that season of life with you without showing them your list. You would ask them those questions on behalf of yourself and let them tell you. And then at that point, um, so I don't know if that person would be your wife. I don't know if you would have a best friend or whatnot, but what are those things that they remember you talking a lot about or being excited about, uh, and then to see if there's overlap there as well. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. Sorry. I want as much detail as possible because I'm going to go and do this. Yeah, I I will. And I said, I want everybody to follow this as well. So I'm going to be plugging this hard for other people in the audience, especially in the newsletter, but continue. Sorry. Satisfaction exercise number two. Yeah. So satisfaction exercise. So you define your priorities and then you also do the satisfaction exercise. And here's the thing that I would say is that you need to do it during various periods and season of your life. You know what I mean? Like where you are right now, Scotty is, is very unique. And so therefore your list is going to be very representative of where you are now. But as soon as something else comes along, like a child or, um, you know, a career shift or something like that, like you're going to need to do it again. You know, so whatever it is now, it's not going to be static. Like it definitely needs to be able to ebb and flow. And the thing is, is that if you don't keep your constant finger on that pulse, like you will go and do anything else, but your priorities just because it's an opportunity, you know? So yeah. Oof. That, that, that hit. That's, that hit. Stung a little. Mm. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. I felt that one. Talking to myself, right. so we're good. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, then, how were you able to refocus your do? How did you build your do around that, that it's not tied into your who and your identity? You know, how, how, how did you restructure how you focused on the day job and then personal projects or any type of freelance. Right. Yeah. Okay. So when I did this, uh, when I did this exercise, I was doing a lot. Um, so my do was like everywhere. Um, so what I did is I time diaried the hell out of myself. So for a solid week, I would keep a log of every single thing that I would do because like the whole premise here is that once you know your who, you can use that through a lens to focus your do. But if you don't know what the hell you're doing, you don't know what to cut, you don't know what to like, you know, streamline or combine or any of those things. And or so kill. 
right? Kill your darlings. Like these are the things that you think. Kill your darlings. Yeah. Oh my God. That's, that's Love it. Stephen King. Like he, he's, amazing. Yeah. yeah, he's my favorite. He's my favorite. Yeah. That's awesome. So go on. Sorry. No, no, you're good. So it's like the, those things that you absolutely love. Is it in line with who you are and the trajectory of which you want to go? You know what I mean? Like you did that. You killed your Pokemon go, darling. You know, you're like, peace out. I'm done. You know? (laughs) And it's like, but in order for you to do that, you had to assess who you are, where you wanted to go and then what you did. And I argue that there are a lot more things that you do or just general people do. I do that I'm completely unaware of. But if I sit down and I take the time to log it out, just like if you're exercising and you're going to log out like what you eat, you're going to mm-hmm. realize that you eat way more uh, or perhaps you do way more than you think you do. And you spend way more time doing it. And so after I did the time diary, I assessed those results and I realized that who I said I was and my satisfaction exercises did not align with what I did specifically from a career standpoint. Right. So, I mean, yeah. So I want you to time diary your whole entire day and I want you to look at it in two different parts, look at it in your personal life, but then also look at it from a career perspective as well. Um, but in this career perspective, the the career perspective is the one specifically that we're really interested in right now. Um, so, what I ended up doing was slashing things. So whenever I did my satisfaction exercise, I realized that like, okay, it's not really about making money for me. Okay. Like I thought that was like when I'm like, Oh, I got this one gig and it paid a lot of money. And I'm like really super like satisfied by that. Nope. That didn't even remotely show up on my satisfaction results. So what I ended up doing was I cut freelance. I cut, uh, stock photography. So I, um, have a Stocksy account, which is like one of the stock, you know, stock photography places. Mm -hmm. Um, so I cut doing that like every once in a while, if I still have an image just because in the grand scheme of life, like I have a random image, I'll upload it, but I won't specifically shoot for that. Um, I realized that I really loved mentoring people and I was mentoring a lot of people, but I realized that I could actually mentor a lot more people if I focused on writing and, I, while I still did a lot of personal projects because side projects have always been a source of personal growth from a craft perspective. And then also I would even think from an endurance perspective, uh, I was like, well, how can I still infuse that with my personal, like with what I'm doing? So I decided that now anytime that I create a blog, I'm going to have a custom graphic in it. And that's going to be my personal outlet to like create my own artwork. Um, so cutting and combining, um, and saying no to things is how I refocused my who and my do. All of it's really hitting home and totally is taking me back to your creative self speech and reminding me why you're on the show right now. Um, something else you talked about was your definition of success and how many people have a skewed vision and definition of what success is. So what is success to you? Yeah. Success for me now is how well does my do align with my who? So like before, whenever I was creating content for, um, for me, whenever my, my who and all that stuff was really skewed, I was so focused on engagement and I was so focused on how many followers am I going to get? What features am I going to get? Um, like what clients, if, am I going to get a bigger client than, you know, last week or last month? And what ended up happening was I curtailed my content to be what I thought my followers would want. And, um, And so that was my, that was my success. Like, oh, I got more likes or I got more engagement or I got, you know, all these bigger and better things. And that is an endless tiring tunnel to chase down. So, but so now since my who and my do are aligned, I see success as is my content elevating the people Meaning like, is, do I have value there? Am I teaching something? Um, am I trying to debunk a creative myth that people believe? Um, am I like pretty much just providing life giving like comments and this is how to do it. And this is how to get there. That's awesome. That totally leads into this question. Like, obviously there is so much power in teaching what you know, even if you're not like trying to reach the experts, you know, you just by experimenting and 
putting yourself out there day by day, you know more than someone who hasn't started yet. And not only is the benefit of your position in yourself as an expert, but you're bringing life into this world and your ability to make an impact on someone else to even start to pursue something of their own. So like what one thing I really love is how you deconstruct your insanely intricate paper crafted photos like they're bananas. What makes you go that extra step to show and tell how you created it? I'm trying to make it tangible for people. I think oftentimes whenever we look at like, you know, the kick-ass drawings that you do and the type that you do, you know, like we look at the end product and we're like, I could never do that. But whenever like you show like a time lapse of it, and this is like one of my favorite things whenever I see any um, like curated design feed on I like on Instagram, like good type or something. Yeah. Like whenever they show like a time lapse, you know, it, it all starts with that first brush stroke. It all starts with that, like and that first decision and then which leads to the next decision, which then leads to the next decision. And like, and I understand, I understand that people normally have a grandiose vision of where the work is going to lead. But for me, I never really know. You know, which is, which is one of those things where I often wonder, like, how am I going to do this to, in a client world? Cause focus lab is so like, they're so forgiving and they're so like, yeah, Lisa, whatever you make, I'm sure it's going to be awesome. Like da da da, mm-hmm. where it's like, and if I showed them the sketch and then I showed them like the real thing, like nine times out of 10, they're like completely different. So it's mm-hmm. like, like from a client perspective, like how, how would that like, how would that roll? Cause I can't sketch, but anyway, that's not what you asked, but that's the question that like, I guess that's a self-defeating question that I always think that I have to like get through. It's worthwhile. Yeah. 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 And so it's like a self-talk. Um, but B is just showing people that it's tangible and it takes that first step and just being vulnerable. Cause it, honestly, some of the work that I see, I see this highly vectored piece on a package label, you know, by someone like, Chad Michael Studio. I don't know if you know him, but my God, this dude is absolutely unreal with his detailed illustration and packaging. But I see something like that and I already immediately feel defeated. Yeah. But when I can see a look behind the scenes, you know, oh my God, it started with some really shitty thumbnail sketches that look like absolute dog shit. Yes. <laughs> and it's like, I can do that. My sketches look like dog shit in the beginning. Yes. But when you don't see that and see the process and someone actually explaining the steps, I feel like it's very defeating for people who want to get into that field or even experiment. And they feel like I have to be perfect right from the beginning. Yeah. So that's like what I love the most about it. It also goes in the fact of showing the work you want to get and showing that you are an expert in your craft, but there's a bigger purpose behind it too. I really yeah. think what you're doing can shed a lot of light to people. Cause who knew that paper crafting and photography was a field until you created it. You're kind of paving the path for a lot of people who don't know about it yet. Yeah. Yeah. Which is crazy. Cause there's definitely tons of masters out there. And I really love the idea too with photography. I mean like tip, like photography is just like, it's literally it, what it means is painting with light. I'm like, so if, as long as you have like a hole and a lens and some photosensitive paper, like you, you have a camera. Um, and photography has this like beautiful, like jankiness about it. And that's why I like pulling back the scenes and like showing people like, Hey, I have this light on a stool. Um, I am literally running and trying to like, you know, throw particles in the light, you know, sequencing, like there, there's nothing majestic about this. This is a very gritty MacGyvery, janky rigged like operation. You don't need 50,000 pieces of equipment in order to make a kick-ass image. Like you just need your intuition and you, and you need to like trust yourself and just move forward. That's that's perfect into this one. This is like my favorite question besides the pizza one. I'll ask you in a little bit, but like <laughs> what's one word of advice you would give to some kind of created who's struggling on gaining the confidence at the start or persevering and sticking with it because they get so lost in comparison. You know, what would you tell that person? Oh my goodness. Um, wow. That's a deep question. Cause there's so much. And so it's like, how do you refine it down to like the one thing? Um, could be one thing off the top of your head. That's been important to you recently before I kind of caught you off guard with this one. I forgot to put it in the questions. You're beforehand. good. You're good. This is my favorite one. though. 
and I, I forgot it. I, it's kind of, I like it that it's off the cuff. Um, your identity is not in what you do. So therefore fail often, fail freely, learn and experiment and take your successes and each of those failures because there is one. I mean, the first image that I ever created, I thought it was glorious but it really was horrible. It was an out of focus image of my daughter uh, surrounded in, cause this is a Christmas picture surrounded in like garland and Christmas lights. And because I had no idea about slow shutter speed, she was, you know, like crazy motion blur and I didn't know how to post process. So I, I amped the saturation and it was like radioactive lettuce, like encircled around her. Like it was just <laughs> the worst image ever. And I could have looked at that and been like, Nope, I suck. But instead, I was like, I'm going to focus on the positive in this. I'm going to learn from that. I'm going to take that tidbit, and it's going to inform my next step, and then my next step, and then my next step. So your identity is not who you are, and grab each success from each failure because there is one. Because it takes a lot of shitty work to stumble across your best work. Yeah, move through it. I love it. Awesome. Let's go into a couple of rapid questions as we wrap things up. We're... In the fourth quarter, actually, this is this is overtime. So, my next favorite question, and Jason Craig, he kind of gave me the inspiration on how to start like addressing this one. So, if you were on death row and you had the option of one slice of pizza, what would be your go-to? So, style, place, whatever. What would your favorite slice of pizza be? Deep dish meat lovers pizza. Any specific place? Nah, man, just give me all that dough and that meat. Just bring it. Anywhere. That's, that's your go-to anywhere. Bring it. Bring it. All right. Pounding calories before the deathbed. I mean, Love mine it. as well. <laughs> all right. You have the you have the experience in typography and the hierarchy and all that. And you obviously have a keen eye for this stuff, regardless if you're just in photography or paper crafting and every other little thing you do. But serif, sans serif, or script? Sans serif. I knew you were going to ask this because, man, I am such an avid listener of your show. I know these last questions and I've been thinking about them. Like even before you even asked me like to be on there, I'm like, what answer would I give and why? And I'm like, sans serif because I am to the point. Like it gets, you know, like script, you get all those flourishes. It's beautiful, but it's sometimes it's just a little bit too much. And serif, you have a little of that character and that's cool. But sans serif, minimal to the point. I love it. Here's one more off the cuff one. Who is a person, an artist, designer, or just some kind of influencer that is really standing out to you lately? Who are you vibing to the most right now? Raji. Oh my goodness. Raji? Yeah. And I mean, and, and I know it's like a cheap move to say your friends, but I think Jason actually said the same thing. Like. Jason said the same thing, but that's cool. Dude, he just put out a killer creative pep talk episode he with did. ADJ Pizza. Like that's my favorite he podcast, did. but that was killer. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And it's like, the would love to have him on the podcast someday. If you're listening, <laughs> Raji. Okay. Sorry. Go on. I, I just, I love how vulnerable. I mean, he, he is that he, he's an, an, an extremely vulnerable life giving individual. Um, and on top of that, he's just like super mad talented and he doesn't have an ego about it whatsoever. Yeah, his design skills, his illustrations are out of this world. Yep. Yeah. So combining yep. the Well, same with Justin too. I kind of paired those two together. So <laughs> they are they are one. Yes, basically. Raj Ten. Like what would their, you know, Bradgelina like name be? Like Justy. <laughs> <laughs> Justy. I like that, that actually that, a lot. Uh, all right, good, because I thought it sucked. No, Justy <laughs> is way better than Raj Ten. Come on. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Okay, I'll take that. Um, is there is there anything special on the horizon that you want people to know about? You know what, dude? Nah, not really. Like I am, I'm at a place where I'm not, um, I'm not evolving. I mean, meaning like I am evolving as a person and as like a growth, but like I am just at a happy place, just chilling out with Focus Lab, doing what I do, you know, on on the regs. I, I've nef- nothing like big going up but you're going to weapons of mass destruction like really soon your speak creation right? yeah yeah, that's yeah. It. i'm that's uh i'm the i'm the saturday night closer so yeah that's some good vibes amazing i'm so well, jealous that i'm not going to be there i i, I think they're gonna videotape it or do some kind of audio so it'll definitely be up i gotta get to practicing but i know i know what i'm gonna talk about i'm really excited about it and i think it's really cool because right now judging by how chill as a cu- cucumber cool as a cucumber whatever it is to me it sounds like you've made it like you're at peace with yourself 
Yeah, so I think that's that's pretty rad. That's you it. you made it. You know, yeah. you're searching for it, but I think you found it. Thank you. All right, that that, that yeah. means a lot. That means a lot. Yeah. So something I'm striving to get because I'm still chasing it, and I don't know what it is. And this episode definitely uh was a kick in the ass for me. So I appreciate you so much. Thank you so much for being on the show today. I hope the listeners got a ton of value as much as I did. Yeah. Thank you so much for having me and letting me share and ramble. <laughs> oh, perfect. Well, have a good one. Thanks for being on here. And again, I'll be in touch. Awesome. Bye. All right. Bye. Damn, I told you she was going to bring it. There were several moments in, you know, this interview where it felt like she was talking directly to my soul. And I love Alicia because she's really talking to herself. Like literally, she's just talking to herself this whole time. Why it feels like she's talking directly to you. And it just so happens that what she's dealt with or went through is what many of us are blinded by. It takes a lot of courage to be transparent like she is in front of large audiences and I know her story is making a massive impact on people because it's made a massive impact on me. If you're finding value from the show, there are a few ways you can give back. Over on patreon.com slash perspective podcast, you can donate $1, $3, $5 or more to help this show evolve and grow. It's really hard to keep up with reoccurring costs like audio hosting, web hosting, recording programs and equipment. Every little pledge helps offset those so I can devote my time outside the day job to bringing you the best show possible and bring on bigger guests and do bigger things. You're not only donating here, I'm also going to hook you up with rewards. I forget to mention that. But pledgers also get rewarded with perks like access to many episodes, patron-only content, critiques on your work, discounts on my shop, and much more over at patreon.com slash perspective podcast. Another way to support the show real quick is by leaving a ratings or review over on iTunes. It not only helps the show get discovered, but it gives me an opportunity to give you a nice little thank you in plugs like this week. So this one comes from The Real Deal by Ben Haggerty, and this was my first official review, and it's by an an incredibly insanely talented dude and he goes under the moniker ben real vs world this dude creates content for people like chris brown ea sports schoolboy q he is the shit and this dude says scotty provides so much inspiration and motivation you have your gary v's your casey knight stats and then you have scotty while that seems a bit overstated Regardless, I know it came from the heart, and I just wanted to thank him publicly. Thank you so much, Ben. I appreciate you, brother. I also need to give a huge shout-out to my homie, Bluka, for all the dope theme music you hear on this show. And he's actually going to be playing at 515 Alive Festival here in Des Moines coming up, uh, I believe, with this this weekend. Yeah, I can't attend because I'm out of town. Uh, Yeah, I'm at Weapons. But shout-out to Bluka. You can hear more of his music over at SoundCloud.com slash Bluka. That's B-L-O-O-K-A-H, Bluka. And as always, I can't thank you enough for taking time out of your existence and listening and hanging out with me right now. I want to continue to encourage you to keep showing up, keep putting in the work, and keep creating. You got this.